Right, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's fourth EIG webinar to be given by Mark Cottrell on analysis of rock slopes and benches using drone data with DFN analysis. My name's Alex Finley and I'm a committee member of the Extractive Industries Conferences. Just a few notes before we start. All previous talks are available on our YouTube channel and there's a link to this in the chat box. Feedback and volunteers are also welcome for future webinars. Please do get in touch. Um, contact details on our website. Again, there's a link to this in the chat box. Today's talk will be approximately 30 minutes, leaving time for a good question and answer session afterwards. And just to ask, please would you type questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, just to make tracing them easier for the end of the talk. And with that, I'll pass over to Mark. Okay, um, well, welcome everybody. Um, so that's the introduction. Um, so the presentation that I'm doing today is on the use of Models for fractured rock. Um, we're not only looking, looking at slopes, but we're also looking at underground excavations and tunnels. Um, I'm going to I'm going to cover three, three main sections in the presentation. Uh, the first one focuses on the the DFN approach. So, what what is the DFN approach? What can it give us? Um, what, what's the philosophy? Um, also, what sort of data types do we need? Um, the second section is focused on how we can use the DFN model for predicting properties that we cannot directly measure. So, what mass properties? Um, section just just goes into stability, looking at block sizing, looking at stress. So things things that we can use to actually optimize the design of near surface but also underground um, excavations. So um, continue. So the, the overarching approach, um, what what is the what is DFN? Um, what is the discrete fracture network method? And the discrete fracture network method, it, it's not new. Um, it, it's been around since the late eighties. So, you know, we're, we're talking close to 35 years old. Um, it's started out in the nuclear industry, but it's, it's really featured in every industry that we encounter today. So everything from mining and infrastructure to oil and gas and, and renewables. Um, Fractman as a, as, a, as a tool, as, as one of the DFN tools out there, it's, it's been with Golder since 1987. Um, it's cross-discipline. It, it's not there just to, just to encompass geological data or rock mechanics data or hydraulic data. It's there to fully integrate all of these different data types such, such that we have, a, we have an integrated site description that we can then use to, to test our, our characterization and to test and optimize our design. Um, DFN, DFN and modeling. So as, as we saw on the previous slide, we, we, we had a, essentially a box of fractures. Um, so much like, the, much like the picture in the lower left here, um, this is really where DFN models originated. Um, so geometrically simple, very little sort of complexity to, to the models. Um, whereas today, the DFN models that we construct are much more realistic. So, so we're looking at honoring and, and capturing the, the key geological attributes of the rock mass that we're, that we're describing. We're looking at including things related to heterogeneity, anisotropy, different fracture sets, different fracture properties, and actually in including those things in a description where we can make probabilistic assessments. 
So the idea behind the DFN approach is to is to represent represent the fractures, represent discrete features in in space. Um, those discrete features they have a they have a size, they have a, an orientation, they have an intensity, so that so they have a frequency. Um, we also include the, the mechanical properties, so things like friction, things like um, stiffness. Um, maybe for flow, we have things like permeability and storage. So we're looking at encapsulating a whole set of different descriptions on the fractures, um, whereas most of the historical approaches, so numerical approaches, have, have really sort of um, homogenized and, and described things on the, on the continuum. And fractured rock mass, fractured rock masses um, tend to be over oversimplified and our numerical models, our continuum numerical models do not fully capture the complexity of, the, of these systems. Um, just, a, just a passing comment on the DFN approach is, is stochastic. So whilst we, you know, whilst we use statistics to describe the orientation, the intensity of these fractures, um, we're actually doing multiple multiple realizations. So each of those realizations is statistically correct, but we, we're getting a range of answers. So we can start testing for things um, related to certainty. And, and confidence in, in a given given answer. So we can start evaluating probabilities for a certain outcome. Um, the picture on the right here, um, okay, it's a, it's a box of fractures, but we have a we have a little tunnel through the middle of it, and <clears throat> we can see the fractures intersecting the tunnel. So fractures that we may observe. As, as we as we observe them in reality. So the DFN approach allows us to incorporate that, inf that information into the DFN model. So we can take stochastic elements, but also deterministic elements. Um, I mentioned, I mentioned on the earlier slides about different industries. Um, this, this is just an example of where the DFN approach is across other sectors. So the, the types of problems that we're looking to solve in those other sectors. So infrastructure, shafts and tunnels, um, groundwater flow, nuclear waste. So looking at safety cases and, and looking at performance, mining, benches, slopes, in-situ stress prediction, through to energy, so oil and gas reservoirs, um, deep geothermal, carbon capture. Okay, um, the overarching technical workflow that we follow is essentially we, we, we start out with a, with a conceptual model. So we're looking at understanding where the fractures originate from, we're looking at where they form, what sort of properties are, are attributable to those fractures. Um, we're looking at then parameterizing the fractures, so we're looking at describing the, the geometrical attributes, we're looking at describing the hydraulic properties, also the, the, the rock mechanical or geomechanical properties, and through Bringing all of those strands together, um, we can build a DFN model that we can then use to start making decisions. Um, those decisions may be may be relevant for one or, in fact, all of all of these. So, implementation, um, cost, and efficiency. It may be to meet certain legislation. Um, environmental reasons. So the DFN approach can help us understand through characterization, but also optimize through testing different designs. Um, one of the one of the more recent one of the more recent efforts of the DFN approach is integration of photogrammetry data. 
So over time, you know, DFN models have been constructed from core. They've been constructing constructed from simple outcrops through through mapping. Um, so you know, manual mapping of, the, of those outcrops through to borehole geophysics and 3D seismic surveys. Um, one of the, the one of the areas that has has received much attention in in recent years is photogrammetry. So being able to take photographs of the rocks and then being able to actually include that data in the DFN model, whether it be to just create the DFN model from scratch or maybe to even just condition the DFN model such that whilst it's still stochastic, we're still able to match features where we see features in reality. So the, the, the three steps um, or, the, or the three groups of steps, taking the pictures, picking the traces, and then using the trace data to characterize and build the DFN. So analyzing the, the fracture traces for size, analyzing the fracture traces for orientation, um, position, and any properties that, that maybe you have associated with different fracture sets. And then with, with that DFN model, we can then start bringing that into our analysis framework. So doing slope stability, doing stress predictions, rock mechanical properties. So I, I'm gonna come back to this example in, in more detail towards the end. Um, this, this is just an example where literally you spend couple of hours flying a drone up and down a, up and down a, an outcrop and gathering pictures. Um, it's a super efficient way of gathering data, gathering large volumes of data quickly. Um, it's much safer and we can start gathering things and then supplement it with, you know, sort of localized, localized boreholes, um, localized mappings by engineers on site. Um, in in this case, so we can see, so we can see, we can pick out the bedding, the bedding features. We can pick out some of the the vertical fracture sets. We can also pick out some of the sort of fault type zones. So through these DFN models, we can pick up quite a lot of data from the photogrammetry. So using this data, we can then start analyzing it. Um, those analyses primarily are centered around the fracture geometry initially. So getting, getting the intensity, so, so the frequency or the number of the individual features correct, getting the orientation of the features correct, getting the, the size distribution of those features correct. So just from, just from the photogrammetry data, we have quite a large canvas from which to gather data and then use that data to actually derive the statistics used to create the DFN model. So all of the dis discontinuities we, we use um, we can be selective on which ones are important to us. So we may, we may say, well, actually, per, permeable fractures, open fractures are our primary interest if it's a groundwater problem. Or we may say, well, actually, all features are important to us. Um, we want to understand where different block sizes exist. So we can use the scan data, the photogrammetry data, to build a model that is quite high resolution, but we can be selective at the same time. Um, the, the, the data that we the data that we take off of the trace map, the properties that we're describing, so orientation, size, intensity, the spatial variability, um, also things like strength properties. So for each set, we're looking at deriving the statistics that describe each of those attributes. So we're looking at coming up with skewed statistical distributions that um, represent the mean of, of the observation and maybe also the dispersion, so the variability. So we come up with 
statistical descriptions for all of the key attributes that describe the geometry of the DFM. Um, we use outcrop data, photogrammetry data to constrain it. We can also combine in borehole log data. Um, so if we've got a, an optical televiewer with fracture data on, we can use all of those informations, all of those sets of information to build a DFN that is actually quite well constrained. Um, so in terms of generating the fractures, um, we saw right at the beginning how fractures in a box is where it all started at. Um, whilst that's fine for small scale models, um, for larger, for larger areas, so if we're developing a, a mine site over several kilometers, if we're developing an oil field over several tens of kilometers, we may wish to in include things like spatial variability. So if we've got certain parts of the development that have maybe no faulting, so is structurally benign, we may be able to get away with a simple model. But where we have structural complexity, we need to be able to adapt our models to that. And we, we do that by using a, an underlying geocellular framework, so it's a sort of grid description. And using that grid description, we can start varying how the DFN looks over larger distances. So if we have one particular fracture type or a certain faults appearing in one location, we still generate them stochastically, but we can use the grid to help drive the DFN. Um, so the overall workflow that I, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate in, in an example is we generate our fractures, we can do some upscaling to get rock mass properties, we can predict stresses, we can then start doing geotechnical assessments. So whether it be stability or support, or maybe even just prioritizing where we want to excavate or mine first, the DFN method methodology allows us to do that. Um, we may also want to do flow. So it's not just geotech, we may want to do dewatering, we may want to do wastewater injection. The DFN approach allows us to address this. Um, as I've said, it's stochastic, so we're doing multiple realizations. So we can we can get a, a probability distribution of the types of outcomes that we're seeing, which allows us to then do parameter sweeping. So we can test sensitivities. We can modify our design to actually achieve optimal configurations. So maybe bench face angles, maybe tunnel orientations, we could test those things and assess stability, block sizes, um, the support requirements using the DFN approach. Um, I've mentioned hydraulics. This is this is just the, the only slide that I want to that I want to show. Um, and it's mainly from a from a characterization point of view. So we can use photogrammetry, we can use boreholes, drill holes for the geometry. But the flow attributes, we have to have flow-based data. So if we have packer tests, you can, you can superimpose that packer test data onto the DFN model and use that to calibrate the, the flow, calibrate the, the hydraulic connectivity in the subsurface. And we can then use that to evaluate maybe tunnel inflows, um, evaluate dewatering and such like. Okay, rock mass properties. So um, the first section, we had the DFN, we built a, an arrangement of fractures. Um, we can use that information to, to start understanding properties of the rock mass. So understanding and predicting properties that we cannot directly measure. So the usual ones could be rock mass modulus, uh, rock mass Poisson's ratio. It could be predicting things um, like GSI, so Geological Strength Index, Q, RMR, so, so, so metrics that are sort of rooted in empirical rock mechanics um, around rock quality, but maybe things that we 
haven't actually maybe locations in the rock mass that we haven't actually got to yet so we could predict rock mass quality properties before the excavation gets there so um, for infrastructure projects it may be you know we can we can use rock quality to predict well what what sort of tbm performance we're likely to get before we get there um, so rock quality, one of, one of the things that we, we often look at with the DFN approach is fragmentation. So understanding the distribution of block sizes, um, understanding maybe how that impacts the, the development of an underground mine. So if we, if we know the block sizes in a certain part of the ore body, we can use that to optimize our, our equipment, opt, optimize our milling and handling equipment. Um, we can use it to optimize draw point spacings. So maybe it's a block cave mine. Um, the DFN approach allows us to very quickly evaluate block size distribution, um, optimize the or, or characterize the the location of blocks of certain sizes within the rock mass. Um, use that information to evaluate well what, what what's the what's the stability of blocks of a certain sizes um, are we are we likely to see something that is detrimental to our design um, this slide here just shows a, a simple example of block sizes um, that, that we predict from the DFN so we we can use the DFN approach we can use all of those fracture sets and, and very quickly construct individual blocks um, where we can, where we can um, interrogate them for, for the key attributes. Um, rock mass properties. So um, as, as I've said, we, we, we struggle to predict rock mass properties on, on the large scale. Um, we're, we're very efficient and, and comfortable at doing rock mass property measure uh, rock property measurement on the intact rock so it could be in the laboratory with tracks or compression tests it could be in the field using um, Schmidt hammer type tests we also have the fractures so it could be just maybe by inspection looking at the surface roughness and being able to say those fractures have a high or low friction. Um, so by using that, by using the idea of superposition, where we take the intact rock properties and we combine it with the fractured rock properties. So the fracture properties provided by the DFN, we can then use that to evaluate the rock mass properties. So the rock mass modulus the rock mass process ratio and this affords us the, the opportunity to combine our numerical predictions with things that have been done empirically so um, hook brown type estimations for, for predicting rock mass we can use these two sort of different but complementary approaches for predicting the rock mass attributes um, Starting to sort of move towards the the the, the geotech analysis, um, so rock bridging. So if if we have a DFN approach for, for a slope, so if we take a section through our slope, and we're seeing different fracture sets, um, we can start using the mechanical properties of the rock mass. We can start using the in situ stress conditions together with the DFN fracture geometry to calculate rock bridging, to calculate the, the, the failure planes through the rock mass. Um, those assessments are, because they're essentially empirical, so we're not actually integrating through time like a conventional numerical approach, it allows rapid assessment. And then if we, if we encapsulate that in a, in a probabilistic approach, so we do our multiple realizations again, we can start rapidly assessing, rapidly assessing um, step path failure 
of slopes. Um, so evaluating you know, where are we going to get the the rock bridges form, what percentage of rock bridges are we likely to see form? Okay, so um, the, the last few slides is, is, is just given some, some examples on how we've sort of carried it forward into, into geotechnical analyses. Um, so looking at uh, in-situ stress, looking at stability. Um, so this slide shows just some examples from a, from a, from a slopes perspective, the, the sorts of things that we're looking to do with, with the DFN approach. Um, so bench scale kinematics. So if we have benches where blocks form, simply evaluating, well, are those blocks stable or unstable? Um, what is the size of the blocks? Um, what is the factor of safety on those blocks? So are we seeing the, the red blocks here, kinematically unstable? The green blocks, blocks that are kinematically stable or geometrically locked in, so blocks that cannot move. Um, looking at layered benches, so you know, taking into account the, the, the formations of, of beddings or the presence of beddings in those systems, understanding how major structures, so fault structures, interact with the small scale features. So are there particular areas in, the, in, the, in an open pit, for example, that are more susceptible to failure because of the failure of fractures, because of the failure of faults? Um, to recap the, the workflow that we started out with at the beginning, so site characterization, so photogrammetry, supplementing it with core logging, analog data, so if, what if we have no site data, we can use analog data, use pictures from Google Maps. Um, parameterization of the DFN, and then the analysis. So the picture that we saw at the beginning, analyzing the photogrammetry for trace lengths, for intensity, for orientation. So Doing that type of analysis, we come up with, with descriptions for the intensity along a scan line, so along the slope. We come up with orientation data. We come up with size data, so key drivers for, for building the DFN. Um, the DFN approach allows us to take that information and build the 3D picture, so, so build the fractures away from the exposed surface. We can then upscale that DFN to come up with rock mass modulus of the rock slope. So we can see which locations where we're seeing you know, stiffer, stiffer material in red, so low fracturing, where, but also seeing sort of degraded locations. So locations where we've got high levels of natural fracturing, we've got lower levels of stiffness. So locations where maybe the, the, the stress, the clamping stresses around blocks may, may give rise to slope failure. The in-situ stresses. So we can predict the in-situ stresses using the DFN description, but in a, in a finite, in a conventional finite element framework. So we have the ability to bridge between the discrete fracture description and then equivalent continuum descriptions. So this is just an example of the, of the stress. So we're seeing, um, obviously at the, at, the, at the crest of the slope, we're seeing lower levels of stress and you know, with, with gravity, um, with the, the slope failures that, we, that we've seen previously, we are seeing modifications of, of the stress field. So we can also then combine that stress field with the block sizes. So these are the block sizes that, that are forming. Now you'll see there's actually very few unstable block sizes here. And, and this is because of the thing direction. So the bedding failures are all into, uh, the bedding directions are all into the plane. So actually the blocks on this side of the slope are quite stable. On the other side of the slope where, where we've actually got sort of downward dipping beds, uh, the block failures are more significant. And again, it's probabilistic, so we can see the, the, the failure 
distribution of the blocks. It's not just slopes, it's tunnels. Um, this is an example just from some underground photogrammetry in a, in a tunnel system. So we've got data that we can use to characterize the DFN model. We can then build the DFN model that matches statistically what we observe. And we can use that to, to help design our tunnel. Um, just a short example on, on where, we've, where we've put that into practice. So this is a, a nuclear waste repository. Um, various shafts, various tunnels, uh, lots of small pits, um, so about 4,000 pits. We've got the DFN model. We, we can then use that to predict not only the, the fracture behavior around all of these tunnels, but also the rock mass performance around those tunnels. So just to, just to conclude, um, the DFN approach is there for um, characterization, um, optimization of, of designs of geotechnical, geotechnical problems in, in, in rock. Um, fractured rock mass is a, a variable. Um, we have the data available, so we should be putting effort to have that, to have that detail in our models. Um, we can make use of photogrammetry, both for near surface, but also underground um, situations. Um, we we're able to combine that with tra traditional sort of borehole logging, um, scan line mapping, right through to maybe 3D seismic surveys. Um, the DFN approach basically provides a, a quantifiable approach for making predictions that you can actually tie to what you observe. Um, it works in parallel with standard industry practices and services so you know we're not we're certainly not throwing away all of the empirical um, techniques that we have this is there to support them and it's there to actually make um, supporting arguments with and overall you know the DFN approach is there to provide a, a competitive edge in terms of understanding the rock mass so thank you very much any questions so, let me, okay, so, uh, okay, question, what, first question, uh, recording of the webinar, um, yes, it's being recorded and it'll be on the YouTube channel, um, so that was an easy one, the discontinuity properties such as coatings, oops, by that one, no. Click the wrong button, that's my fault. Sorry, how are the discontinuity properties such as coating types and thicknesses, roughnesses, and waviness accounted for when modeling if they cannot oh. be discreetly measured? Uh, so you could you can include them just as a statistical description. So if all you've got is a you know, a, a mean and deviation, you can you can you can either just sort of stick your finger in the air and, and apply it uh, using a normal distribution. If you have more detailed laboratory data, you may you may have the, the, the ability to put a, a more appropriate dis distribution. But I think to give an example, if you have, say, surface roughness, um, so JRC, if you have you know, if you've done basic core logging of, of JRC for different fractures on the core, um, if, if you then split that into the different fracture sets, you can, you know, you can assign those as simply or as complicated as you like. You, you, you could just use a, a constant value or you could give a, a distribution of values. Um, those values don't have to be constant across the single fracture plane. So you could actually have them varying. If, if, you're, if your fractures are, are, are very large, so you know, if they're maybe, let's say you've got some really big fractures of 100 meters, but you know that things like infill or roughness varies across those fractures, you can actually um, assign spatial variability to, to account for that variation. So I, I don't think there's a, 
I don't think there's a, you know, a set way of doing it, but you assign properties based on the information that you have. So, you know, if you have very little information, you can just assign them very simply. Um, whereas, you know, at the other end of the scale, if you have lots of information, you may want to do something um, more exotic, more elaborate, um, depending on the, you know, the importance that you feel. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, next question coming in, then rolling in nicely now, is in producing the drone for photo tomography, are you using software like Pix4D, Drone Deploy, or Maps Made Easy to acquire the imagery over a set grid? Um, so, so we, we, we tend to use uh, a piece of software called um, Shape Metrics, which is out of, um, produced by a company in Austria. Um, so we, we do tend to use that. Um, what we're, we're also doing is um, using the state Shape Metrics data and then just pulling it into Fragman and then just actually picking, picking the DFN uh, fracture traces ourselves. Um, picking, picking the trace data is, is not too, too difficult, but actually building, you know, that 3D surface, um, shape metrics does, does a much better job of that. So, okay. And are there any charts data sheets that quantify rock types and their typical fracture rates? Uh, yes. So there is a, there's actually a very good textbook on, on the internet, um, uh, written by a guy called Ron Nelson, and that that book is all it's it's all about naturally fractured rock masses, and you will you know you will find um, you will find data in 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 that textbook that will give you sort of ballpark figures for fracturing you know fracturing properties fracturing attributes. Um, so certainly you can use that data as a, as a starting point. Um, but you know, the reality is all fractured rock masses are different. So, um, if you find things like the depositional history, um, any tectonic loading, um, faults, even, even just the, the bedding thickness, um, has strong influences on, on the pattern of fracturing, but, yeah, there, 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 are, there are plenty of textbooks out there that can give rules of thumb for, for those properties. Okay, and from Anonymous, what would you say are the limitations of this analytical approach? Uh, the limitations, so I would say, I would say probably not just this approach, but um, of all numerical approaches, um, many users tend to rely on a single realization. So they, so they construct their model and they do one version of the model and they say, this is the answer. Um, so that, 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 is, that, is, that is a broad limitation for all modeling. Um, we try to alleviate it with the, the multiple realizations so we can get a, an idea of the uncertainty um, but I think, you know, understanding, you know, understanding or recognizing that we can't just rely on a model and we just, we certainly can't rely on one instance of a model it is, it's, it's a, it's a risk for, for all modeling. It's a risk for this approach, it's a risk for, for all approaches. And, um, this was actually one I had as well, but obviously the drone survey you said is quite quick, but how long does it take to produce a final model when you've got the data? Uh, so once you have the, once you have the, the, the drone data, um, pick it, picking the fractures can be, that can be quite intensive. So, you know, you, you may have quite a, you know, you may have something that's a couple of hundred meters and you, you may want to sort of manually pick beddings and fractures. So that can be, you know, that can be quite intensive. Uh, once you have that actually constructing the DFN model can be, can be quite quick. So, you know, you're, you're probably looking hours to days on a, on a, on a, you know, on a, on a, on a small scale. So the slope model that I showed, um, so based on, based on the fracture 
PIP data that, were, that was provided to me, actually constructing that slope model was only a couple of hours. Um, so it could be quite quick. Um, as soon as you get sort of large, you know, very large models, so if you have a model that's 10, 15 kilometers, um, where things do change, and you start having to pull in, say, large numbers of boreholes, um, then things things can, things can sort of become longer to, to, to do. But yeah, for for the most part, you can you can set up DFN models relatively quickly, and um, you know we're we're not we're not looking at at, a, at an approach that takes you know days or weeks on end to run. We're looking at models that we can create quite quickly, but then actually create multiple versions of the same model. So we may do a hundred versions of the same model. And then that, you know, creating those hundred versions, um, whilst it's a click of a button, it still may, it still may take sort of one to two days to actually do all of those model generations. And I suppose following on from that a bit, do you use any image analysis techniques to highlight the fractures or is it all pick by eye? Uh, so, so certainly, certainly for, for borehole, borehole image locks, so fracture image locks um, where there may be automatic picking, um, yeah, that, that data, you know, I'm no sort of image log interpretation expert, but um, you know, manual picking or, or automatic picking. Yeah, we can we can use both. And again, the one that, that ties into a question I had is, I'm guessing the method is a bit more limited in area with the, no visible rock outcrops or slopes. And, you know, again, you've said, mentioned you do this for oil and gas, so you're offshore, you know, yeah. pouring under the ground. How does that tie into your model? Um, okay, so it's, we, we may we may have a a single say a single well for an oil reservoir that's um, so that's an example would be the west of Shetlands where we're you know we're in a deep water environment we're three thousand meters below the surface we have we have one to two wells that have image log data so we can use that well data to build a pattern of the fracturing at the well locations. In those conditions, we can then use 3D seismic surveys. So, seismic surveys that um, um, so indigenous come behind a ship, um, but we can then use that to help build the DFN model away from the well locations. Um, Sorry, you broke up a little bit there. Could you go back to what you're saying just about seismic surveys? Yeah, so, um, so the DFN approach, it, it, it allows us to tie or correlate the pattern of fracturing that we see at the well with attributes that we see on seismic surveys. So we may see different seismic attributes correspond to different levels of fracturing in the rock mass. So you can, you can use it to really reliably predict what the pattern of fracturing looks like away from, away from well control, away from um, where, 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 you, where you cannot physically measure. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's certainly very applicable for locations where, you know, you, you don't have that ability to, to, to see into the rock um, physically. Okay. Um, a couple of come. What's the best method to estimate the depth of fracture traces? Dimensions and depth direction for fracture surface and also what shape should the disc be taken, should the taken disc form? Okay, uh, so fracture, fracture shape and um, fracture shape and size is, is, is probably the, the, the hardest attribute to get right on a DFN model. Uh, if, you take, if you take a single borehole, you can see you can see the intersections. So you can see the frequency of the intersections. You can also see the orientation of the intersections. What you don't see is the full fracture. So um, outcrop data, outcrop data allows us to see the trace length and using the trace length data, 
we can we can use that to help characterize the or help define the size distribution of the fractures. So if we if we're seeing, um, if we're seeing different trace lengths for different fracture sets, we can characterize each of those sets with its own individual size model. Um, if you have a seismic survey where you see fault lengths, uh, where you see fault traces on your survey, you can use that seismic survey to help define, help constrain the, the size models of the fractures. Um, so, the other thing for fracture size, I mean, if, if, we, if we peel it back to basic geology, um, if, we, if we look at an outcrop where we see, um, we see a fracture, we may see the fracture height is confined to bedding. So that actually allows us to, to, to really come up with a size height, but then actually it's just the length that is uncertain. So the, the addressing the size question tends to be almost an, a, an amalgamation of different data sources um, to actually constrain that size model. Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I mentioned in passing, so we can use the DFN model for hydraulics. So if we have a plot test, we can use that plot test to help constrain the size model as well. Um, so the, 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 the pressure time response, the pressure derivative response, tells us about the connectivity of the fractures. So in turn, it tells us about the size of the fractures. Uh, but uh, as I say, you know, fracture size is, is the hardest one. Fracture shape is, is actually much simpler than, than it sounds. If it's a, it's a case where you know, maybe the fractures are influenced by the bedding. You know, we tend to have fractures that are square or rectangular, elongated, um, elongated fractures. If they are fractures in a, in a crystalline environment, um, we tend to use more every, every dimensional, so maybe hexagonal or even circular fractures. Um, so we, 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 do, we do tend to try to tie the shape to the geology. Um, Sorry Mark, you broke up again there, just after you oh. talked about bedding again. Sorry. Um, so the, the, the fracture shape, um, the fracture shape is, is, is something that we just tie back to the geology. So um, in sedimentary systems where we have layering, we tend to use rectangular fractures, so fractures that are aligned with bedding. Um, in crystalline environments where, where the fractures are more equidimensional, we tend to just treat them as either hexagons or, or, or indeed circular fractures, um, because those, those are the types of fractures that we know that form in those types of rocks. So, um, so shape tends to be looked at quite simply. Size is, size is the, harder, the, the harder metric to, to to constrain and you know that requires that requires often multiple multiple data sources. And how okay. much has this model been updated in previous years? The Earth is a dynamic environment, so I'm guessing quite frequently. Uh, so it's I, I suppose in I mean if we're, if we're talking in you know infrastructure or mine development you know we're really interested in present day um so you know we're looking at describing present day conditions um in terms of geological time um so if we if we take cases say in the oil industry where we're really interested in the formation of fractures such that we can predict where maybe oil accumulations occur and where the fractures also occur to, to aid production of the oil reservoir, you can, you can actually build this model over geological time. So you could build your model at 50 million years ago. You could then have some sort of depositional and erosional series of steps, uh, tectonic evolution, 
and we could then predict what is the fracturing at that point in geological time and then you could step through it so so the the, the time question the time question is, is is really dependent on the problem you're trying to solve if it's just present day conditions where your mine development is going to take 10 years well we're interested in present day but if it's you know longer time periods so you know things are evolving over millions of years or, or maybe it's somewhere in between so if we take a say a nuclear waste repository where we're interested in the performance of the repository over tens of thousands of years we can we can we can build that dfn at that period at that period in time we can include things like um, glacial loading we can include things like climate so temperature changes and then update the dfn accordingly okay thank you and um, one final question i think from me just to um i'm not sure if this is answerable Mm. Is there a key control on fracturing? You know, is it if you as a rule of thumb, would it be mineralogy, original discontinuities, or regional stress fields, or is that just not possible to answer? It's, it's a, I, I, I mean, it very much depends on, you know, it, it, it depends on a combination of things. I mean, in, you know, mineralogy, rock type, um, structural position, so faults, tectonics. Um, it could be bed thickness, curvature, um, it could be stress. Um, all of those things play a role in the formation of fractures. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not a case of sort of saying this is the, it, it's this type of rock Therefore, this is the recipe. Um, you, you, you do have to look at the data. So as an example, in a, you know, maybe in a, in a, in a limestone rock, say in, say, Portland, um, so on the south coast, we could say the natural fracturing is, is a function of the bedding that we see, um, also the, the curvature. Of the bedding. Um, if we go to the west coast of the US, so in, in Oregon and Washington state where there's the, the Salem limestone, the natural fracturing there is not dependent on bedding, not dependent on curvature, but it's more dependent on the, the actual mineralogy of the rocks, the density, even the density of the rocks. Um, so, you, 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 you cannot sort of discriminate on rock type, um, you really have to treat each case as, a, as, a, as an individual um, until you start sort of de deriving the relationships for the fractures. But um, what, you, what you end up doing is coming up with a, almost coming up with an expression where we're saying fracture intensity is equal to 10% rock type plus um, another percentage of mineralogy plus another percentage of structural position and you, you, you come up with those relationships based on the site in front of you. Well thank you very much and thank you very much for an excellent talk and detailed question and answer session. We have well over 100 attendees at one point so I think that speaks for itself how well it's gone down. Um, just to reiterate, a copy of this talk uh, will be going up on the EIG YouTube page. There's links to that at the top of the chat section. And if you can't remember that later on, just Google Extractive Industries Geology Conference on YouTube, and you'll either come to our website or our YouTube channel where you'll be able to see this and the previous three talks. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Cheers. Oh, Cheers, Alex. Thank you very much. Cheerio, everyone. See you later. <laughs>